Yo, guys, it's Kyle coming at you from Bain's Film Reviews. Today, I am sitting down with Douglas Brian Miller and Mark Shapiro, the writers, directors, editors, and producers of what I would consider a groundbreaking uh, documentary in Downwind. It's uh, fantastic. It is uh, being showcased at Slamdance, uh, and I, I hope that everyone has, has a chance to look forward or has a chance, the chance to watch it uh, like I did. I thought it was fantastic. Again, it was groundbreaking. And um, I'm so glad to have you guys sitting down with me. And how's everybody doing today? You're doing well, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. We appreciate you taking the time with us today. And um, we're we're also uh, we're we're thrilled that you that you have this feeling about our film. Thank you. It's a labor of love for us. Yeah, of course. Um, so I find documentaries difficult to dissect because it's the things that happen typically are very natural and you're kind of tasked with bringing something that already exists to life rather than, you know, scripting it and, and manipulating it to fit whatever narrative you want to tell. Um, but before we get into the actual film, I am curious how you guys got into filmmaking in the first place. Uh, Doug, I, I guess I'll start and then Doug, you can chime in. Doug and I um, met in the early aughts of the millennium, I would say, you know, the early 2000s, uh, we worked yeah. on documentaries together. Um, for a company called monster.com where we did um, sort of B2B type uh, videos, but also things that were, that were connecting with mm -hmm. uh, students, high level students called the diversity leadership program. Okay. Where there were, there were kids from all over the country, um, rising juniors in college. And it was our, we were, we were sort of tasked with telling their story to not only, you know, find the inspirational side of their journeys. Mm -hmm. um, we also worked with major uh, fortune 500 companies and things like that so we were creating content you know starbucks and american airlines and enterprise rent a car mm. um we were doing things that were sort of uh telling stories and we doug and i love telling stories and that's how we mm. that's how we met working on this project yeah okay and maybe doug you could chime in uh yeah basically that's kind of we started out with this idea of doing mini documentaries uh for these clients telling these stories, these immersive stories of people in their, you know, their trenches of their work day and all to help sort of sell a product. And then mm. during the course of that, we're like, wow, we're really getting, you know, engulfed in these personal lives. And this is basically storytelling just on a small scale. We should just start thinking about, you know, long-term storytelling right. for feature style. And that's kind of how it, it blossomed over the years. Very, very cool. And then, so how did this specific idea for downwind come to be? Well, whoever, uh, whoever wants to go. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. We actually started out trying to uh, investigate the uh, conqueror film and the exposure they had mm -hmm. based off the tests, uh, you know, in terms of like a, a Hollywood production. And uh, it, it honestly led us down the rabbit hole of, connecting the dots to things that were like questions unanswered and people who were exposed outside of the supposed area and then mm. it just kind of we just kind of it was almost like investigative journalism in a way but we kept asking the questions we kept getting more immersed in these stories and then one thing led to another and then it blossomed into like our, our i like to call our lens metaphor for the film the through line is okay. we start out in one location and we zoom out throughout the entire planet and so it was supposed to be something local, and then it just kind of blossomed. Okay. Very, very cool. Oh, I think you, uh, Mark, you're muted. Sorry. I would add to that and say to Doug's point about the, the lens metaphor, where we started in on St. Saint, on Saint George on the Conquer and Snow Canyon. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we get to this point of understanding that we're all downwinders. And um, by that, we mean that every single one of us is potentially has been potentially exposed to radiation mm -hmm. from not just the 928 nuclear detonations that took place, but also, you know, any, anytime a nuclear power plant has an issue, you know, we've seen that with Fukushima, Three Mile mm -hmm. Island, Chernobyl, um, or other areas where we, we are all potentially impacted by down, you know, fallout from, from downwind, they call it. And yeah, yeah. Claudia Peterson in our film talks about, talks about that, how, you know, we're all downwinders. And to Doug's point, we were really surprised. We, we saw this production, The Conqueror, that was impacted. And we, we found that to be fascinating. 
but then when we zoomed out we realized it really does it, it does impact everybody there are pockets of radiation throughout the yeah. world the country and the world yeah and um to that to that lens metaphor i think you do a great job of leveling the playing field because a lot of times when you look at documentaries you, you get those viewers that go well what does this have to do with me and i and yeah. i think that you do a great job of making it very clear how everyone's affected and we're all in this together and it does a great job of reeling in viewers and keeping them captivated and, and focused throughout because they feel like they're part of it thank you yeah i mean it was actually yeah. a, a prolific moment for us during production because we realized <laughs> along with you that we were included and we're like yeah. oh okay so yeah thank you of course of course um, and then this is one of the more intense documentaries that I've ever watched. Um, I, I guess the first three quarters of the film, it's incredibly intense. It's incredibly dramatic and it's depressing and uh, all of these things. And I, I want to get into uh, to when we bring in Lewis Black later. But for the majority of that film, it's incredibly intense. And why did you guys make the decision to pretty much omit comedy for the comedy or, or any sort of, sort of levity? through the first you know three quarters of that film i'll, well, I'll jump on this oh sorry Go yeah ahead. well i'll say that uh mark and i are pretty down-to-earth guys i mean we mm -hmm. we have a sense of humor where but because of the connections that we found because of the cancer that's happened in our both our mm -hmm. families the seriousness of sort of the, the the knife's edge became more clear as we went forward so Mm -hmm. as we were affected hearing these stories, you know, we were coming into the first interview happy and thinking, okay, we'll talk about the conqueror. And then we start to realize what damage this stuff really did. Yeah. It, it's sobering. It's a sobering reality. And so we kind of wanted the film to portray what we felt during this process of coming into it. It's just, it's an awakening. Uh, and it just sort of, I, I personally felt like, we need to grab people's attention and set them down and show them something that we don't want to have any sort of distractions. Sure. This is something serious and it, it does affect all of us, all of the generations uh, and everyone in, in the planet. And we may have a problem. We may have to take this seriously. And so we kind of yeah. wanted to really get your eyeballs on that screen for the first half so that you realize, okay, I am included. Yeah, and I, and I, I feel like, you kind of you become immersed in this this drama and the depression that everyone else is dealing with and like every step of the way you kind of dig the dagger a little bit deeper every we're always finding out something new that's even more intense than than what we just learned about and we do a great job of pulling us in um and allowing us to to really understand and appreciate the things that are happening but but then there's that huge shift um while it's still intense and we still under, understand the severity of everything that's taking place. Lewis black showing up and being part of it adds that comedic element. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you literally see him on stage doing stand up comedy and I laughed out loud numerous times while watching him. Mm -hmm. But I think that seeing that comedian express the serious sentiment kind of made it more intense and more accessible and more understandable but I'm mm -hmm. curious why you you guys decided to create that juxtaposition between drama and comedy. Um, I, before you go, before you go, Mark, I'll say one small comment. I have to say that Mark Mark was had the brainchild of this, and he was talking about we need to have some sort of a a break in the film. Our our sort of formula needs to give the audience a little bit of a breather. And Lewis had a bit about this particular topic that was pretty mm -hmm. good. But what struck me and kind of pushed me off the rails was how fast and his moments that the audience understood and related what he had said, meaning they all knew about it. And yeah, it's a running joke and the seriousness of it is there, but every single person in that audience, that wide shot that HBO did, it, you could just see everybody laughing and bending over. Mm -hmm. And that told me it is top of mind. We just don't like it to be top of mind. No one wants to talk about it. Sure. So his comedy kind of helped break that barrier and connect the voice to make everybody talk about it. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'd also say that Lewis Black added sort of this condemnation of, of the United States government in a, in a ludicrous uh, reaction to our response to testing. Mm -hmm. So 
that comedic the 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 piece we put in there about hiding under desks while it's funny and we're laughing about it we're also realizing that that it was real it was something that duck and cover and those drills that happened and Mm -hmm. you know we're we're pretty remarkable when when you compare the you know this nuclear a nuclear bomb blast that they're preparing people for and then i'll say what was interesting for us was there was an interesting shift in our production as we were preparing for the lewis black interview uh, the new New York City came out with that PSA about nuclear nuclear power or nuclear bombs, yeah. which was a lot of people were saying that was just so coincidental, and it was. But there were a lot of things that were coincidental as we were making this film, which mm-hmm. leads me to believe that everything is pretty interconnected. Not necessarily yeah. coincidence. It's just it is what it is. I guess the the war in Ukraine probably prompted the the city of New York to set up like a preparation drills for potential nuclear bomb detonations. But in the, you know, several, you know, decades later, we're basically just repeating the same message about what yeah. what you should do. Go deeper into your apartment, you know, throw your clothes in the washing machine. Anybody who's, who's lived in New York City knows that, you know, you're lucky if you have an, a wash, washing machine in your apartment, right? Yeah. And, and Lewis actually thought that was funny, too. He thought, well, the first thing I took away from that was how nice her apartment was, you know, yeah. and <laughs> and just, and every, you know, the 3D graphics and everything just made everything surreal. And I think getting back to the original question, there was a surreal element that Lewis Black lends to this mm. that we that we really wanted. And, you know, it just it just explained and expressed this idea of like, well, what do we do about nuclear weapons? How do we how do we protect ourselves? And it gets all the way back to Claudia. We we don't because it's not something you see. It's not a it's not a visible thing. So okay. that was part of the reason why we wanted him to be in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, that that's very obvious that you know he's an advocate for this. And but then you have Michael Douglas, who was also an advocate for change and and bringing these things to light. And so, what was the process like getting those two individuals? Because I mean, to a lot of people uh, from the outside looking in, those two individuals are larger than life. How do you go about getting them to be a part of this uh, this process? When Doug and I sat down to look at the people we wanted for this, for this film, we listed out by name, you know, just sort of pie in the sky. What, 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 who could we get for our film? We wanted to make sure we had downwinders. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure we had people representing the native Shoshone communities. Mm -hmm. And then we thought, well, what about Hollywood? Because to Doug's point about the lens metaphor, downwind impacts everyone. And we thought about, you know, the people that were advocates and the people that were passionate about, um, you know, being act- activists, activist patriots, we, we like to call them people that really use use their, um, like Mike, Michael Douglas is a messenger in peace from the United Nations or Lewis mm-hmm. Black, who for years has talked about, you know, government and also the fact that, you know, we just need to hold people accountable. And Martin Sheen as a narrator, yeah. we thought, could could this all come together? And it, and it did. And the reason we were able to to have them for our, in our film is that they, they they firmly believe in the topic. You know, they, they want yeah. people to become conscious of what's happening and so mm-hmm. we we did our best to um aim for the people we really want for this film and we were able we were able to to get them and they were they were incredibly um generous with their time and and because yeah. we're all we're speaking the same language mm-hmm. My, michael's involvement uh because of his you know his film china syndrome as a producer and actor mm-hmm. um you know that was a valid exercise like it really turned him into his activated moments of you know yeah sort of protesting or if you were being activated but what struck us during the interview was when michael told us about his dad about kirk douglas and that the family was basically around near ukraine during the um, chernobyl accident and the downwind from that moment hit his family and they couldn't be found so in a sense he was also a downwinder yeah as us in the film and it was one of those you know starring moments of whoa you know it, it's not it is everywhere it was right again another heavy heavy situation that was that i didn't even know about until he told us on camera i was very surprised yeah and uh, and again oh, i'm sorry to mean to cut you off go ahead oh it was just quickly i was going to say claudia in the very beginning of the film talks about low use segments of the population that the government knowingly mm-hmm. um according to her impacted you know with, with with the testing impacted those made three significant groups the yeah. native american community the Mormon community and ranchers, people that don't generally have infrastructure, well, to the point where they don't speak out against the government. And yeah. what our point was, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted those individuals first, but then John Wayne became 
sort of iconic as sort of an American symbol, you know, did yeah. it, you know, the, the headlines came in, did America kill John Wayne? That's a story that one of our other, um, one of the, one of the other members of the film that we interviewed broke the story about, you know, did America kill John Wayne? Mm -hmm. And then we, again, zoomed out to Doug's point again about the metaphor. We zoomed out to say that Hollywood or the, the rest of the world was also impacted by this. We don't really, you know, we're, everyone is the everyone holds the same amount of importance in this world everybody yeah. from you know and and to pe to call people low use segments of the population well this got out and impacted the entire world so the the quote unquote celebrities that we use they're just an example of the of the fact that downwind impacted everyone and got onto this higher mm -hmm. level of mm -hmm. of you know the radioactivity got onto and, a higher and, level and impacted everyone and to michael's yes. point while while talking you know he he is a patriot and so are Mark mm -hmm. and I. We, we love our country. We love our mm -hmm. freedom. It's just that we need to take care of what happened. We need to prepare for this not to happen again, A, and B, compensate right. those who need it, who need the help. Um, and so you resonate with these people. They become more like you than you think. And that's yeah. kind of how we wanted the film to, to go, is to bring people in to say, wow, we're all in this together. This is not just a story from our grandparents' era or our parents' era. Mm -hmm. so um and, and then a couple of points to that um one being like as i had previously mentioned you kind of level the playing field from beginning to end again using these individuals that sort of appear from the outside looking in to be larger than life to allow them to exist on the same plane as you and to have experienced the same things as you is such a great way of uh interest uh, uh creating interest generating interest and allowing those viewers to appreciate what's going on um, and then I was really, I, I really, really appreciated, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but you had mentioned the Patriot thing. People were constantly asked the question, are you a Patriot or not? Yeah. And I feel like oftentimes we look at these things and they're, it's one or the other. We, it's red or blue. It's, it's one or the other. Yeah. It's ne there's, there's never any gray area. And I thought it was a really interesting question to be posed over and over again. And you sort of got a very similar answer from everyone. We we love our country, like you like you said, Doug. We love our country, but advocating for change doesn't mean that we don't. It just it's just yeah. an important part of being a patriot. And I'm curious yeah. how you guys came up with that idea or how, where that that question came from. Um, uh, oh, ahead, I, for, from my point of view, as you know, cinematographer, when we were doing the interview uh, with Ian. Mm. It just happened because Ian actually was getting pretty fired up. He was really getting into his yeah. moment. And Mark's like, well, this could, this could be seen the wrong way if you, you know, cause we're only, we're not like going to show the whole discussion we had outside his house and in the car and all these things that led up to mm. that moment. Right. Cause we don't have time for that. So mm. Mark just said, well, I, I got to get him down. I got to get him to commit. And he said it, Do you, are you, are you a patriot? And the answer was as, as it followed, like you said, it's very, very similar. That we, yes, we are patriots, but we have to change with the fix. And so it became a, a mission to make sure that we do show people that everyone is in our film is grounded. They're all committed to, yeah. the, to the United States, to us, to, to, to America, to what we all believe in. We just need to make a case for change and to heal. And then, honestly, in my opinion, prevent this from happening again. Yeah. I think um, the activist patriot angle mary talks about it mary dixon where she says we are all under that same flag i think people talk about activism and, and patriotism as being something like what that happened on september on january 6th yeah. the insurrection you know those are patriots but we're all we all have a responsibility to ian's point to hold our government to the highest standards you know of yeah. elected officials and you know that consciousness has to be raised yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And again i really i really appreciated that because I, I never felt like the documentary was pushing me in one direction, but the reality is, is that you're going to get viewers that feel like you're trying to force them to think one thing over another. And I think that posing that question allows them to understand that these are not just people that hate their country. These are people that genuinely love their country and because they love it, they want to make this change. Exactly. Um, so again, I, I think that's a very important part. And I think without that, uh, there may have been some frustrated viewers or you may have lost some people along the way. And I think that was a really, really good and interesting way of, of keeping them, uh, keeping them interested and, and keeping them involved throughout. Um, and, and then you guys just mentioned Ian and I, I wanted to ask a couple questions about Ian because uh, it was very obvious that he was getting fired up throughout and it was very mm -hmm. obvious how passionate he was and 
he he looked like he was uh, about to to lose his mind in some some instances and i like that about him because he's very honest and he's very raw and i think that's essential in this film um but i imagine that there's pros and cons to that and i'm curious if you could speak to those pros and cons yeah i'll I'll jump quickly here i think mm-hmm. ian is such a powerful person when you meet him in person he is all mm-hmm. about protection of the environment protection of the land that he considers to be shoshone land which it is shoshone yeah. land by deed and you know we we just want him to speak speak his mind um he's frustrated clearly because he feels like he's been devoting his life to this cause and wants others to follow suit and mm-hmm. wants to be an inspiration he is to the, his community and he is and his community is all is all of us yeah. so those in those ways you know we we were we just let the cameras roll and, and let him talk mm-hmm. because it was one of those things where we just need to be quiet and let Ian talk. And that was but really what the, we wanted. The to other do. side of that, I'll, I'll say this too, in the editing, Mark and I went back and forth on this a lot of what do we show? Does there's, there's, there's moments where Ian's, for example, wiping the, the sweat off his forehead. Is that, is that relevant? Is that relevant? Do we need that? Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, in terms of editing, I thought as yes, my thoughts were yes, because everybody can resonate with being frustrated, right? We all had yeah. issues similar to family problems or work-related problems, whatever. And something was done that was in unfair to us. And we, we just, that, that moment of, you're not listening, you don't understand. I, I, I guess I need to make my point more valid. I don't know. And you're just frustrated. Mm-hmm. We've all as a body been there. And those moments are the subconscious moments that I think help people resonate faster with Ian because they see mm-hmm. themselves in his shoes. They've been there. And that's why I wanted to keep those moments in the film so that we do bring that shock value across that he Mm -hmm. he is literally having a moment on camera and he, he's so like worked up and he's trying to focus what he wants to say, but he doesn't want to go off too far. And I, I, he's being genuine and that helps the audience understand that we didn't give him a script. We didn't go over topics in terms of please say this and this and this, and don't do that. We, we left him to do his thing and, and I, I want the audience to see that that's real. Yeah. And I, I often when I'm watching documentaries, I, uh, I I wonder how the writers and directors are able to get the people being interviewed to stay on task and stay on subject and remain level headed. And it, it almost seems fabricated sometimes. I'm, I'm not saying mm-hmm. that it is, I, but being but seeing Ian like this, I've had outbursts. Everyone else watching has had mm-hmm. has had outbursts. And like you said, it allows them to resonate with him and allows them to understand him on a, on a completely different level than if he had just sat there and said, I, I love everyone and I want everyone to be safe. And I'll, seeing how frustrated he is is such a, a pivotal part of the film. Uh, thank, thank you. you. We, yeah. we actually yeah. wrestled with the idea because we, we went, as you see in the film, we went literally down to the gates of the test site that's still mm-hmm. operational. And yeah. I, think they know, I think they know Ian there. And I, and I know that security there were, you know, they were, they, they were respectful, you know, but, yeah. but they were there as security to stop us from going in. And Ian um, obviously was, was upset. And I've, we've seen him in other documentaries where he's, where he's also upset, you know, down at the test site, but we, we wanted to show the raw feelings of what it's like, not only being down at the test site or, you know, there's a part where he goes, he's going through the, the test where they named tests after native American uh, communities. And yeah. you know, that was something that was, you know, deeply that's, frustrating. That's actually a real moment. He's actually, he had not read that before. So in wow. that moment, he's going through that list. He gets halfway down and he kind of stumbles because mm-hmm. it's, he's processing that it is all of the names of his, you know, things that they, that they term in his, his, his world. It's like Apache this. And so he, he was sort of struck off, off the cuff there for a moment. And that was another moment of, of realism that we wanted to keep in the film. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Kyle, to your question about how do you get people to open up about these things, it yeah. was interesting because I have this booklet here, which um, United States Nuclear Test Booklet, which is from the Department of Energy that was given out to Jern. I don't think you can see it very well. Sorry. I'm yeah, there we, there we go. But, sorry. But um, so this book was given out to journalists that were at the test site. And uh, one of our um, one of our sources, um, Keith Rogers, who passed away actually during during production was an amazing oh, wow. incredible uh source for us he connected us with a lot of people anyway the journalists were all were all handed this booklet and it lists every single detonation you know from 1951 to 1992 and 
that actually opened like with Lewis Black, it opened people up. We we showed mm-hmm. him the book and he was like, I had no idea nuclear testing was going on. I knew about Nevada or I knew about Alamogordo. People know about the Manhattan Project. We were aware mm-hmm. that, you know, that there were definitely some nuclear shots that were detonated, but I don't think people understood the significance of the impact of the number of tests, you yeah. know, above ground and and below ground. And that some of them were, you know, much, much bigger in yield than Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nagasaki bombs. So things like that, it was really truth that opened people up. We didn't prompt anyone. We let the cameras roll. Doug is an amazing um, cinematographer. He lets he there are certain things that he likes in. And sometimes we we in the initial part of the interview where we're just getting to know each other and talking about the the film and the impact, we let the cameras roll. We're telling that, you know, they 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 they're aware of that. But it mm-hmm. also gets emotions to be very raw. And it's a nice, um, a nice way to actually show the truth of something that I don't think people really understood what was going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then one of the things that I that I noticed that I thought was very interesting was the score. The score plays such an important role. And there there's this like whirring noise that that plays in the background constantly, oftentimes like when Ian is speaking. Um, and I'm curious about the decision to to include that. It, we went back and forth on that too. Uh, Jaina, our composer, did a lot of sort of um, string-based, you know, very beautiful orchestrated pieces. Mm-hmm. But we needed something that was almost like a, a alarm, like a little light on your dashboard, like a little orange light, yeah. something that was, you know, not not causing you to to have a super excessive amount of worry, but would cause a little bit of an alarm. Yeah. And we found that some of these sounds that we that we could simply generated tonal sounds could do the tricks there's a lot of different stuff in fact there's you'll hear a piano in there and that's actually a, a, an old piano that we found during a shoot i think 15 years ago okay in the in new york that was underground somewhere we we're like doing a subway thing there's a piano there and i just started playing it a little bit little keys here and there and mm. we used that noise that sound and kind of you know push it backwards forwards and change the pitch because mm. we needed another part of this another character to sort of be like this almost security guard like warning you okay stay stay in the line watch out make sure right. you look over here pay attention um and to help keep the eyeballs glued to that so that the, the, the level of intensity would grow as we get to these moments where people are starting to sort of percolate and and pop if you will yeah i, I think it allows the film to remain semi-uniform where it, things are very linear um but it I think I used the word daunting to describe it at one point and because it's a constant reminder of this this horrible thing that has happened and is continuing to happen. So I think it I think it supplements the film and the and the subject matter very well. And that's hey, that's you. why that's why I felt it was important for me to mention it. And I mentioned it in the, the review. I know you haven't seen the review yet because I'm not able to post it yet, but that'll that'll be out shortly. Thank um, you. Of course. I was, I was going to say the to that point. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where there's a there's sort of a smell or something that's that is, uh, you know, technological or or man made or something that's that's mm-hmm. that's constantly there. Maybe you're there for over an hour. You're just in an area of town or something where you just smell something. It is kind of to that point. It's something that's that's it. You know, it's in the background. You know, it's unhealthy. And to Doug's point, it sort of keeps you on the edge of your seat, knowing yeah. that something's here. And that's. With our movie, the message, you know, a lot of it is just about getting people, uh, raising consciousness about what's happening here. And so what people have been living with, what Claudia has been living with, you know, her whole life, what Mary's been yeah. living with, what Ian's been living with, what Darlene has been living with, uh, all the, the subjects in our film. And so it's it's that constant reminder of something's there. And it's hard to express that in the film um, any other way. But yeah, and I, so I, I kind of uh, connected it to, so for like, I don't know, five years now, the uh, airbag sensor in my car in the passenger seat has been kind of wonky. And sometimes it likes to ding while I'm driving, especially when my wife's sitting in the mm-hmm. seat. And when we drive, you know, eight hours to the Outer Banks to visit my parents, it dings, you know, 500 times between here and there. And it's just that constant reminder, like you said, it's something that's unsafe. And it's just something that I can't do anything about because it's so expensive. Um, and obviously a different reason than than the film, but it's, it's this constant reminder of that, ridiculous thing that shouldn't have happened but is happening and it's unsafe so i i I sort of made the connection to that and i and that helped me to to understand it a little bit and then then by the way to doug's point initially because he brought up the idea of of a a hazard light in your car Mm. we wanted this film to be something where anyone of any political 
following would appreciate. So whether mm-hmm. you're a Democrat or Republican and independent, um, we wanted we wanted this message to get across uh, as a universal message. And so that's something, again, getting back to the, your, the car light thing, it's something we, we're all dealing with. There's always something going on, um, but we want it in this, in this 94 minutes, we wanted people to be kind of sitting in and focused on what's happening. And it is uncomfortable. There, yeah. this, something happened that was, that was devastating to several communities, all of us really, but it's not just a message of victims. It's also a message of inspiration as we get to the end of the film. Mm-hmm. These people are all like, to, to following up on the question about Ian, he you know, is an inspiring person. So is Claudia, so is Mary. And they're spending their lives um, trying to inspire this message. So it's, if in those 94 minutes you're feeling uncomfortable, imagine, put yourself in their shoes. This is what they've been doing their whole lives. And yeah. it just get, it sort of brings yeah. that sort of connect. There, there's a, you might notice that there's like this subtle sound of, for obvious reasons, based on the film name, but of wind that kind of connects everybody mm-hmm. to that comes and goes. And I got to tell you, as an editor in, 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 in the production room, <laughs> that is the scariest thing ever. Some of the static B-roll shots you'll see with the trees blowing. Yeah. You're like, huh. when a tornado comes down the road, I know what to do. I'm getting the hell out of the way. Right. But this stuff is just blowing by and it's there and we can't see it. What are you supposed to do? Yeah. Um, it, it sort of gives you this, I, this, this sense of hopelessness. But at the same time, uh, Downwind is inspirational. And it reminds us that, again, while we're all connected, we sort of all have each other's back mm-hmm. in, in this. And not just in this, but in other things as well. It transcends other other issues as well. And I think it's, I, I really, really appreciate that about it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Of course. And then I know that you guys are showing at Slam Dance. I believe it's this week. Um, and uh, where are you guys headed after this? Where can other people locate you after slam dance so uh obviously we're the world premieres on january 23rd we're actually having a panel mm. i think this is gonna air after after we're done here but we're actually holding yeah. slam dance slam dance allowed us to do a one-hour panel on the same day as as our premiere featuring oh, cool. the folks from the film and that was one of the reasons why we were so excited about being at slam dance in addition mm. to it's sort of the epicenter utah is so connected to all the people in our film and we really wanted mm. to be in utah as a premiere so we'll start there. And then um, if people want to follow us on social media, it's Instagram, it's at backlot docs. Okay. Um, and also downwinddoc.com. We'll have updates as to where the film is. We're working with um, folks um, in terms of distribution and we'll have mm-hmm. all those announcements come. We don't have any, we can't say anything yet, but sure. um, we definitely, please keep your, keep your eye on social media on those at backlot docs or downwinddoc.com we'll have more information about screenings perfect i will uh include links when i upload this so everybody can follow along um and then of course and then so this seems trivial compared to the severity of what we've been talking about but i'm always i always want to ask this to end the the segment um what are some of your guys favorite films Doug, you mm. want to go first? That's a... um, yeah, I so I have a thing with uh, Velmo Sigmund in terms of cinematography, uh, Close Encounters, obviously Steven Spielberg. So I go pretty far mm. back. I'm I'm the kid that cliche kid that had the you know eight millimeter camera and ran around. So from a visual standpoint, um, you know, Close Encounters is way up there. Uh, okay. I, I could transcend over to Heat very quickly. Uh, I could jump over to Wolf of Wall Street just because of <laughs> what Marty did. That's just yeah. insane. Uh, but uh, I have, it's hard for me to answer because I have so many buckets <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that feel, feel different. Cause I, I don't just watch a movie and enjoy it. Unfortunately, I have the, uh, the film crew brain. So I'm like dissecting it for different mm-hmm. reasons, but, um, uh, yeah, those are some of my, and of course I, I wouldn't be able to say anything without saying Empire Strikes Back and my friends would kill me. Oh, uh, so there you those. go. No, yes, absolutely. That's one of my favorites still. <laughs> That's totally oh, start. Star Wars, um, but same with Doug. I I feel this, but I also like directors that go real to real personal stories. Like I was thinking mm-hmm. of Mike Mills or Noah Noah Baumbach, um, two of my favorite filmmakers. Um, obviously Tarantino. I love the sort of uh, in the same way that Lewis Black. It's sort of you know he's stupefied by things around him. I think Tarantino just goes overboard with things that are just incredible and shows sort of the um, it, he's such a great American filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And anything with, you know, these, these incredible stories, you know, I, I loved, uh, 
I love The Hateful Eight, you know, and I loved a movie called Beginners, which is a Mike Mills film, Noah Baumbach, mm-hmm. like I mentioned, Noah Baumbach's films, and Spielberg, obviously, uh, yeah. and just just great storytellers. You know, we we all love mm-hmm. that. And then Doug and I, you know, also, we, you know, small foreign films that never make it to, um, never make the, never make headlines. You know, sometimes I look at films like moments from films, like uh, I'll see, um, you know, just, just individual moments in films. I'm just like, I just, I love how filmmakers capture moments. So I think yeah. in this story, you have the idea of technology, Doug's love for technology. And then I just, I love great storytelling. I think we both do. And I, I, all of those together just sort of help, help combine like our, our vision for our films. Very, very cool. And Jason, you're not off the hook for this question. You have to participate <laughs> in this one. I have to participate in this one? Yes, you well, do. I I enjoy uh, hearing other people. Well, then you've, I think you, you're you going to have to jump on as well. I don't think you've listened. Sure. Um, but you know what? Going back to Scorsese, I grew up a Scorsese fan. Well, let's put it this way. I became a Scorsese fan as a teenager. So I would say top five movies for me are a couple Scorsese's like Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, After Hours. I love mm-hmm. all three of those movies for all different reasons. And yeah. then sentimental favorites, like I get into really old Hollywood stuff, like Citizen Kane, Casablanca. Yeah. Just stuff like that. Those are my five. I'll leave. Very, I'll very leave cool. That. Jason, that's I, that's awesome. Jason, on you had no idea that question was coming and you like rallied off five great films. <laughs> <laughs> that That's always the most difficult question. So yeah, kudos to you for being able to, to answer so quickly. And, and what is your, what was your, what were your favorites? So, yeah. so I always say Empire Strikes Back is my favorite. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've, uh, I've always said it, not just because it's a great film, but um, my dad took me to reasons, see it. Right? Yes, yeah. but a, a big one is my, my dad took me to see the midnight showing when it was re-released before the prequels, and he he just worked a lot. We didn't have a lot of time to spend together, so that's something that resonated with me. And I always remember st- going to the theater, staying up past my bedtime at seven or eight years old, and going to see the film for the first time and I just loved it. Um, but I just watched uh, Cha-Cha Real Smooth this morning and that's fantastic. That was so, so good. Um, I really liked uh, Palm Springs with Andy Samberg. Um, there was a uh, an indie film uh, called One of the Good Ones that came out a few years ago uh, by Jesse McKinney. I really, really like. Um, and then I'm like a huge Marvel nerd. I love all the Marvel movies and shows now. Um, so yeah, it's it's a tough question, but I, I would say that those are in my top right now. You, you know, to your up. point though, real quick about right. our dads, uh, I have to say, my dad was a uh, he was a composer. He worked with uh, Michael McDonald, Steely Dan, Fleetwood oh, Mac, wow. and all that stuff. But you know, he had he had he had a thing for movies too, right? But he was one of those guys who was very intense, and he took me to see uh, Interpire as well. And I remember we were late, of course. We walk in and we sit down and he's going to go get popcorn and I have to sit in the seat and I want him to see the you know the battle. We came in right during the snow battle and man, he got up, turned and he just slowly sat back down. And it was one of those moments where I was watching him, not the screen. And to see yeah. my dad that connected, that's what sold it for me. Yeah. That, that's funny that you said you guys were late because when we saw A New Hope, we were late. When I yeah. watched it on television for the first time, the opening scene it came on the television. I looked at my mom and I said, this isn't the right movie. Because I hadn't seen that part before, and I was like, "No, this isn't this, this isn't that." Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that's so cool. Um, thank you so much, guys, uh, Doug and Mark, for sitting down with me, and Jason for hanging in there and participating as well. Um, I hope that everyone has a chance to watch Downwind, and I hope that it resonates with them like it did with me. Oh, thank thank you. you, thank you, Kyle. This means a lot to us. We really appreciate your time, oh, and um, this is, of this course, is great. Thank you. You're very welcome. You guys have a great day, and best of luck at Slam Dance and going forward. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, thanks, everybody.